Blind since birth. A once spirited kid with big dreams now finds herself in a locked psychiatric facility. A wounded young woman in the midst of a global pandemic. Heather Hutchinson is with me today to tell her story. From meeting unlikely allies in the dirty streets of some of Latin America's most impoverished neighborhoods to discovering difficult truths about discrimination in her home country of Canada, Heather Hutchinson offers poignant insight into mental health awareness. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad that you are on Never Ever Give Up Hope because reading your story you're like the poster girl for my show (laughs) there are so many things that you are going to share today and the human spirit in particular is going to shine I'm so happy to have you now as I said earlier you were born blind But you've also struggled with mental illness from a young age. This is going to be interesting. I'm really excited to hear what you're going to share about both of these things. You are indeed an overcomer. There is no question. And that's what Never Ever Give Up Hope, of course, is all about. Tell us what it means to strive for an ordinary life when you are often treated as anything but ordinary. And if you would start with the beginning of your story, I appreciate that. So I was born blind, um, grew up in Canada, moved to Latin America, more specifically Peru, um, just after university. Um, So I have those kind of um, juxtapositions, really, of these two cultures and these two countries and, and how they treated me differently and then I also have kind of the parallel theme of struggling with my mental health since a really young age which ultimately culminated in me being hospitalized for psychiatric care when uh, during at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. The first couple months of my life it's actually possible that I saw for the first couple months of my life obviously I don't remember this Uh, But it is a possibility. When I was a couple months old, my parents realized that I wasn't looking at things in my environment like other babies did. And they took me to the pediatrician. And it actually took a couple of years for them to receive a proper diagnosis. But it was pretty apparent early on that I was severely visually impaired. And as I started to speak and I was able to tell them what I could and couldn't see, that became more and more clear. So I do have some light perception. It's it's severely, you know, I need to use either a cane or a guide dog for mobility. I'm a braille reader. I don't read print. Um, so obviously it, it has severely impacted my daily life. And for the first couple of years, honestly, people always ask me like, when did you, when did you realize? And it wasn't like this, this realization of oh, I'm blind, you know, my parents talked about it, it wasn't a secret. But I think when you're when you're a little kid, you're so surrounded, you're in this bubble, right, of your family and your friends, and they just treat you like you. So it wasn't until I really started expanding into, you know, school and things like that, that I noticed, I remember there was this one day on the playground, I was probably about five and we were on summer holidays at the coast 
And I was playing with this kid who was probably a couple years older than me. And we were playing all afternoon. We became good friends on the playground. And he asked me why I never looked at anything after we'd been playing for a number of hours already. And I, I said to him, you know, I'm I'm blind, like you would tell somebody, oh, I have brown hair and blue eyes, because right, it wasn't right. really like a positive or a negative to me at that point. And his reaction was so sudden and so violent. We were standing at the top of the slide, and he actually pushed me backwards, yelled some insult about me being blind, flew down the slide, jumped on his bike and pedaled away. And oh, I remember lying no. there, just like looking up at the sky and being like, okay, I'm different and this is forever and I can't fix this. And forever is a long time when you're five years old. Do you have any idea why a child would respond that way? I have no idea. And it's something that I've thought about for actually didn't cross my mind until I was actually writing my book. And I started going back, you know, it's not something I thought about a ton. Right. And then I started thinking about this kid and thinking how this all started. And I wonder the same thing, you know, he, he obviously learned that from somewhere, you know, I don't think kids uh -huh, uh -huh. generally respond with such, with such hate and such violence if they're not learning it from somewhere. So I try to like have compassion for him as well, because obviously, you know, I think he clearly had some struggles as well in maybe his home life. That's a really positive way of looking at it, which makes you unique. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try. <laughs> Now, you mentioned that you ended up in Peru at some point. Was that as you were an adult or with your family or what was the situation there? Yeah, so it was right after I graduated from college and I kind of grew up surrounded by the Latin American community in Canada as much as possible. And I noticed about that community, you know, this is a huge generalization, but generally in Canada, people tend to have one of two responses to my blindness. Either they like studiously ignore the topic to the point where it's like uncomfortable and it's this elephant mm -hmm. in the room, or they try to pretend they're totally cool with it by like cracking jokes, which is great. I mean, I like a good blind joke as much as the next person, but they're not <laughs> funny when you've heard them like a thousand times exactly. before. People like really aren't very original. <laughs> but in Latin America, in general, people, I don't know, they're, they're more willing to just meet you where they are, they, where you are. They don't get weird. They don't really ask questions, but they just observe and they they accept everything as it is. They want to include you. That's really important to them. Um, so, you know, where people in Canada might be worried about like, oh, you can't do that activity with us. It's dangerous for them. The fact that it's dangerous comes secondarily to, you know, community is really important to them. Friendship's really important to them. Family is really important to them. And they want to make sure that everybody feels like they belong to a group. So I went to Peru really to be immersed in that acceptance and to be different for a different reason, you know, instead of always being the blind girl, being the girl from Canada instead. Good point. You know, you mentioned about how people respond. And I find that so interesting because... Well, first of all, I've got two blind friends, and I never think of them that way. Yeah. And it's no different than having black friends or white friends or exactly. somebody who is different from you personally. I mean, they're, they're a person, and we accept them for that. Yeah. I also have interviewed quite a f number of guests on this show who are either quadriplegics or in a wheelchair and have talked to them specifically about the subject of how they are treated differently and one of the things that I have always asked them is to share and to enlighten us on what people should do and I think sometimes you know like when you're walking towards a door for example and somebody is in a wheelchair you automatically want to run up and make you know open that door for that person when they are quite capable of pushing that button that opens the door. Yeah. And it's that kind of thing. On the other hand, I love it when a gentleman will open the door for me as a woman, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I think it depends upon an attitude. And this is yeah. what you're talking about. So what can you tell us about how people might look at a blind person differently? not the way that they are normally doing it now. 
I think that people like really overcomplicate this. You know, they're so worried about offending mm-hmm, somebody mm-hmm. that they they just get, you know, they fall all over themselves not to be offensive. Where I think we just need to treat people like people, as you were saying. And instead of thinking, you know, I think it's it's great to have empathy and to try and put yourself in somebody else's shoes. But when it comes to disability, that can actually be a problem because what people forget, you know, they're trying to imagine my life as a blind person as their life. So, you know, they just wake up one day and they're blind. You know, I've had a lifetime of practice doing it. So my life's a lot easier than they're probably imagining that it would be if they were them. So instead of thinking about like, oh, what, you know, if I were blind, what would I want? Think about, oh, if I were a person, what would I want? You know, would I want somebody running across a grocery store to ask me a question about, you know, my medical history? Because that happens like a lot. What? Oh, I know. It's crazy. Like people run across the the store to be like, oh, were you born blind? And it's like, how does that even like affect your day? Like, I know it's crazy. People actually do that. Yeah, it's wild. Or just on the bus, they'll start asking, you know, oh, do you know why you are blind? What's the what's your eye condition called? And you know, like you haven't even asked my name. Why are you asking me these things? Okay, what's your insight on that? What's your take on why people? I, I'm blown away. I had I had no idea. I guess because I'm one of those type of people that don't look at you or other people differently yeah. which is obviously a good thing but I can't imagine going up and asking somebody that so what's, what's your take on that why they do that I, I know it's like I can't imagine it either and I I guess clearly they're not thinking about like oh if this were me I might assume that somebody else is or you know, this person's been asked this 50,000 times already, they might not want to answer this question. And I'm a complete stranger. I think people do it because, again, with, you know, some generalizations, but nobody does that to me in Latin America. And it's almost like here, we feel like we have a right to information, you know, our education system's Mm. pretty, pretty strong. And, and we feel like if there's information, we are entitled to have that information. It's also a society that has looks at things differently as far as acceptance goes. Would you not agree? Yeah, yeah, I think so for sure. And I remember when my son was quite young and um, you never know what kids are going to say, right? <laughs> yes. And we were in, I think it was uh, the bank And the lady that was serving us had a lot of freckles on her face. Like one of those that you can hardly see the regular, you know, the skin without the, but the freckles. Yeah. And he looked at her and he, he probably was about three and he studied her for a long time. And then he said, excuse me, why is your face covered in spots? (laughs) And she said to him, it's the way I was born. And with a big smile on her face. And he said, oh. So that kind of covers, you know, both why people are inquisitive, of course, but they're not three years old, right? Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, you expect that. From exactly. Kids. You kind of expect adults to have a better filter, but often exactly. they don't. Exactly. It's incredible. I know. So anyway, I appreciate you sharing that. And again, I had no idea. And it's interesting, like you said, the different cultures. Now, my second question, you were hospitalized for psychiatric care. Yeah. And... I don't understand that. Explain that to me. So it started when I was pretty young, probably about six or seven. Um, I had some difficulties at home. My dad was diagnosed with cancer when I was three. So he was going through a lot of treatments and things like that. And then when he was done treatment, he actually left for the first time. He did come back for a while and then left again the second time permanently. Um, But about six or seven, I started really struggling with anxiety, with changes in routine, with the the worry around losing people or not having somebody with me when I need them, things like that. So I started getting sent home from school a lot because I would always be sick from anxiety. My stomach would be upset. And my parents took me to the pediatrician and I, I hope this is getting better for kids. But at the time, he was kind of like, you know, she's just an anxious kid. She'll grow out of it, which is really unfortunate because obviously I didn't. And with so many illnesses, it's so much easier to treat when 
you know, you catch mm-hmm. it early. <laughs> so um, I think by my early teens, the depression had kind of started probably leading from that anxiety because, you know, who wants to feel like that all the time? So you're looking for, you start to look for a way out. I also lost somebody to suicide when I was 12. And I, it was kind of this big secret. Nobody really wanted to talk about it. I heard, I overheard adults talking about it, which is how I found out. But there wasn't really any help for me to process that. So instead of thinking, oh, you know, that's a really tragic end to a life um, from a disease that's as real as any other, I started thinking, you know, I understand where she's coming from. And I almost like idolized it a little bit that, that she had had the courage as I thought at the time, to, you know, find her own way out when things got too tough. Wow, quite the concept. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, so that was that was a bit later. So I struggled throughout my teen years and my 20s with major depressive episodes. Okay, I'd be fine for a while. And then I'd be really not fine for, you know, weeks, months, And in November of 2018, I entered into one of the episodes that didn't really come to an end like the last one or all the other ones had. So I started losing weight. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. My hair was falling out. And it was like months of that. I finally went to my doctor, set up an emergency meeting, and we were able to keep me out of the hospital that time. Um, basically he adjusted my medications. He made sure that I was getting more outpatient support and things started to improve. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and all of a sudden the supports that I was relying on, you know, with so, as so many people with so many different illnesses, they couldn't get treatment all of a sudden or their treatment was inconsistent. So my doctors and my therapists weren't seeing people in person We didn't even have video calling at that point, so it was all by phone and they weren't seeing, you know, the physical signs that I was declining again. And I think I just wasn't far enough into recovery to manage that on my own as much as I needed to. You know, I was still meeting with them occasionally, but it was really inconsistent. It was really hard to get appointments with psychiatrists. It was just a mess for so many people. And part of my thing has always been with my anxiety has always been about control. And the pandemic came and I couldn't control anything. Mm. And what had gotten me through my major depressive episodes before was, you know, these survival goals that I'd have. Like, I can't kill myself until my friend from Mexico comes to visit or I can't kill myself until I go to visit Peru one more time, things like that. And then when the pandemic hit, so I would I would schedule like specific dates for these things and work towards them. And then as soon as those dates were gone, I would have to plan something else so I could keep going. But when the pandemic hit, I no longer knew if or when any of that stuff was going to happen. And I was like, well, there's no point in living without attainable goals. So I made my plans. I got my affairs in order and the day before I was going to go through with taking my life, I was like, you know what, I'll go to the hospital and I'm not going to get better, but I'm going to seek absolution because when I'm gone, I want my friends and family to think, well, she tried. So I went to the hospital. I figured, you know, they're just going to be like, oh, you're fine. Go home. Obviously, uh, that's not how it ended because I was admitted as an involuntary patient. Really? Yeah. And... Were you afraid at that point? It was really scary. I think part of me was so numb by that point that it was just kind of like, well, whatever, I'm I'm here. But it just really felt like, okay, like I finally reached the end of the road. Like my partner was with me. Um, They didn't normally allow people into the ER because of COVID, but they made an exception so that he could escort me. And they took me into psych ER, which is like a part of the ER that is behind locked doors basically and as soon as I was admitted they were like to him okay you have to leave and I just remember like this heavy metal door like the sound of it slamming behind him and the the beep as the as the lock engaged and just being like okay this is it this is the end of the road no matter what happens from here nothing's ever going to be the same something happened when you were in the hospital 
yeah. that basically has changed your life. Can yeah. you tell us what happened? So it was a couple of days in. Initially, I was just like, well, I'm just going to bide my time while I'm here. They'll let me out. Then I can continue on with my plans because I still had no interest in getting better. But there was this one night I was laying awake. They had been changing my medications and I couldn't sleep. And the air ambulance arrived bringing a critical patient to this bigger hospital for treatment. And as soon as they arrived, they called a code blue over the PA system. And I remember lying there and I started thinking about this patient's family and thinking like, wow, they must be having one of the scariest nights they will ever know. And I started thinking about them and thinking, well, how can I have so much compassion for this stranger's family while knowing that the decision I want to make is going to devastate my own? And then I started thinking about the patient themselves and like, wow, this is such a crazy juxtaposition because they're in here fighting to live and I'm in here fighting to die and I have a choice. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. We are going to take a short 30 second break and I have more questions for you. And I know that you, one of the things that you're going to share with us is taking that journey from despair to acceptance to hope. We'll be right back. Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another. Gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering, or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. One of the things that you said on your website that really struck me was you went from despair to acceptance to hope. Tell us about that journey. Yeah, so it was a long, it still is a long journey because I don't know that we ever really reached the end of it. I think healing is the journey. It's not this destination. There is no finish line. Um, but what I meant by that was, you know, really starting from the hospital. I don't know that there's, you know, many further places to go down than in a locked psychiatric facility at the beginning of a global pandemic like it was it was kind of a nightmare it was really my rock bottom for sure and moving through that you know aided by that night in the hospital and then after that night things actually got harder before they got oh better my because goodness. all of a sudden I cared you know before I had just been so numb and just like let me out so I can go home and die and now I actually cared. And I remember the next day having something happen in group and just being like so devastated. I remember I went back to my room and like they just it it was like all these years of grief and pain just came to the surface. And I I didn't know how to deal with that. And it was like really a cleansing. They ended up having to sedate me because there was just no working through it that day like that was the kindest thing that they could do and then you know try again tomorrow um so yeah that was the beginning of that journey of moving through to acceptance accepting the past accepting who i am now who i will always be you know the things about me that i can't change and moving through that stage into hope you know maybe Maybe there's more for me in this life. Maybe I can do some more good in this world before I leave it, you know, leave this place a little bit better than I found it. But in order to do that, 
in order to have that hope, I need to stick around to do it. How do we educate people who have not faced these challenges? I think I think that's one of your passions. And also, how do we encourage people who are facing them? Those are big questions. I think for education, there's still a long way to go. I think we're doing better at ending that stigma. But I think there's a lot of information that we're not really talking about. You know, you see the the influencers on Instagram being like, oh, I went through a really hard time, but I'm all better now because nobody wants to talk about the hard stuff. Nobody wants to talk about the messy stuff. And without talking about that, we're not really moving forward. I don't think we're not educating people and we're not making people who are going through it right now feel less alone. So I think sharing our story is is twofold in that way. We're educating people. You know, it doesn't have to be comfortable. Sometimes the biggest lessons and the most education comes from being a little bit uncomfortable. So I think, yeah, sharing our stories, um, sharing tips that have helped us, um, you know, as somebody who's come out of the hospital, as somebody who's dealt with these kinds of things, I've seen family members and friends do things really well for me. I've also seen them get things really wrong. So I think it's important to have people who have been through that, who are able to share that information with the loved ones of people who are going through those situations, because often they just don't know what to do. It's scary. It's confusing for them as well. And then I think for the people who are going through it, just really being honest with them. Like I always wonder if sharing our own darkness can actually be the light that guides somebody else through theirs. So I think we have to, as much as possible, you know, some people it's not within their comfort zone, but as much as possible, sharing that darkness, sharing our own stories so that somebody can find hope in that, that, you know, maybe they're going through this awful thing, they can't see a way out, but somebody else has gone before them and found a way out. So it is possible. Well, that is the message that I have been sharing for the last eight years, and that is what pole vaulted my this show eight years ago was I finally was convinced by many people around me to share my own story. And so even the hidden parts that I had kept hidden from even close family members and friends, thinking that they would think less of me by mm-hmm. sharing that story. However, what changed was my entire life and as soon as my book came out and then this show was birthed shortly after when I realized that there are a lot of other people out there who have similar stories that need to be told when we realized that I think it's almost and I hate to use this word but it was almost maybe a selfish act on my part by not wanting to share that story because I was more concerned about me and my pain than what might be able to help someone else. Mm -hmm. And so it's a shift in our thinking. Instead of you're not just sharing your story to say, oh, poor me, and that was not my intent. But to have other people say, oh, my goodness, I can relate to that. I went through that as well. And that's where it changed for me. And I realized that it was almost a form of selfishness where I kept that hidden for so many years. But that was then and this is now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that exactly. is all part of our journey. So thank you for bringing that up. I totally can relate as do so many hundreds of people I have already interviewed on this show. Tell us about your book. So it's a memoir. I found for me personally, that the the best self-help books that I've ever read are actually memoirs and not people being like, okay, step one, you do this. Step two, you do this. You know, almost being like preached to. I prefer to learn lessons from other people's journeys and what those journeys can teach me about my own journey. So that's kind of why I wrote it as a memoir. So the first half of it really deals with these two parallel themes of me growing up as a blind person in Canada and in Latin America and what that was like, because people often ask about that. And the other theme, the other parallel theme was my simultaneous struggles with mental illness, which ended up in me being hospitalized. And then the second half of the book is sort of in in journal or diary form that goes through each of the days that I was in the hospital 
and really shares what that was like, what I was thinking. Um, my, you know, sessions with the psychiatrists and the psych nurses and really how I grew from that experience and then what it was like afterwards getting out and, and what that journey has been like and what I've learned from it. I think if you are curious about disability and what's that that's like maybe if you're a parent of a child with a disability although I will admit that it might be a hard read um, for somebody like that but you would you know you can see sort of what what's ahead for your child and maybe head some of those things off because you're more aware of them or if you are a family member of somebody with mental illness who wants to know sort of you know, I really tried to strip away the mystery of what happens behind those locked doors in the hospital, because often when we're, we're in there, we're so sick that we are not really able to share that journey with our loved ones who are on the outside wondering, like, what the heck is going on in there? So I really tried to strip away that mystery. And then I think for people who are struggling as well, um, to encourage them to reach out for help, you know, as hard as it is, I know it's like this momentous thing when you're going through it because you don't you feel worthless you don't feel like you're worthy of help so why are you going to reach out for help and if you don't get help the first time why are you going to keep reaching out um, but I've heard from some of my readers that it actually gave them reading my story the courage to reach out for help and some of them were actually hospitalized and they said you know I, it was a lot less scary knowing from your story, you know, what that might happen, because I think so often when we think of the psych ward, we're thinking of how we see it in the media, you know, mm -hmm. one flew over the cuckoo's nest or whatever. Exactly. Like, And it's just, I think most places, you know, every facility is going to be different. But I think generally, we've come a long way since then. And they're much more holistic programs. And it really, I'm not going to lie, it's not a pleasant experience, but it's not 24 7 terror either well the stigma has been removed yeah now what do you have another book coming out like what, what's next I don't I was just in LA and wrote a number of songs so we are going to be heading into the recording studio pretty soon here um, to record some new songs that are going to be released as singles for the over the next little while I had an album come out this January as well so I've been really kind of my my books called Holding On By Letting Go and the album that just came out, all my friends joke that it should be called Holding On By Letting Go, the musical, because it really kind of takes those themes yeah. of the book and puts them into music form. And I would say you know, the, the singles coming up are are fairly similar like that as well. Kind of the, the mental health, you're not alone sort of thing. What kind of music? It's the last album was like a little bit all over the place. I guess the, you know, there's some piano ballads. There's some like a little bit of electronic stuff going on. Um, I was really fortunate that I didn't have like a timeline to work on this last album. So I really got to play around and experiment with what I wanted to do, which which kind of took it in like a million different directions. But generally pop, I guess. It most definitely has been motivating. Awesome. And it has been inspiring, definitely inspiring. And as I said at the top of the show, I believe you're the poster girl for <laughs> the human spirit and what can be accomplished when you set your heart and mind to it, which is what you have done. Your music, your book, just everything that you everything that you do is amazing. And I so appreciate you being on the show today. Is there anything you want to say in conclusion, either in summary or a word of encouragement, whatever you would like to say to close the show? For sure. Yeah. First off, thanks so much for having me. It's been awesome. And I really appreciate getting to share my story with your listeners. And a word of advice, you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I have all the answers because I don't, I don't think anybody does, but there's one thing I can tell you for sure. And that's that there will come a day when you will stop in a moment and you'll feel so much profound joy in that moment. And you'll think to yourself, if I had made a different decision, I would have missed this. Hold on for that moment because it is coming and it is worth it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Heather, for being on Never, Never, 
ever give up hope. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.